So thanks for having me and uh, usually I'm between beer and, and today I get to follow yes but I'm not sure which is worse but uh, <laughs> uh, so what I want to talk about is um, just how we've used the EvoCEP in the core lab so I, a lot of this work or all of this work was done um, at the core facilities work biocenter at SickKids um, where the constant question was how do we get really deep proteome coverage in a really short amount of time because we build based on mass spec time. And so one of the ways uh, what we tried to do is develop an assay. And so, you know, go back to to fix this. Better? So going back to you know signaling pathways and, and, and the hallmarks of cancer, you know, very popular paper that came out back in, in 2011 where we look at you know there are six different hallmarks and any and perturbations in any one of these can essentially lead to um, development or maintenance of cancer. And then a more recent study in, in 2018 started to look at these signaling pathways and how they relate to cancer. And so 9,125 tumors, all TCGA um, sequenced, um, were looked at and 89% of these tumors had at least one driver alteration in 10 common signaling pathways and 57% of these tumors had at least two. So similar to what Jesper was talking about, getting into these deep, low level signaling pathways is really the key to understanding how these drivers and hallmarks of cancer um, uh, are perturbing the, the normal homeostasis and, and the signal. And so, you know, the majority of these interesting and targets are not the easy hanging, quick, ac quick assay, you know, top thousand proteins, they're, they're low level proteins. And, and when you think about proteomics, and most people in this room probably know this, but when we talk about, you know, common dilemmas, what we find is, you know, if you have a triangle of sensitivity, scalability, and, and comprehensiveness, and, and, you know, to get either you know sensitivity and scalability you have to sort of be in the targeted space but to get this deep comprehensiveness you need to be in the in the discovery based approach and so um, we've used EvoCEP for both of these applications and that's you know what I'm hoping to show you today and, and how it compares so you know putting all this in perspective a recent well I guess it's not that recent anymore it's still in bio archives but um, Basically, uh, Perte et al. look at all the genes that could be available um, for coding, found around 43,162 genes, 21,000 of those protein coding, um, and 21,000 non-protein coding. And of those, you know, in an experiment, we're looking at identifying somewhere between 9 and 11 as, you know, an ideal number in a quick experiment. And so how do we get this level and, and is it feasible? So, you know, really EvoSteps will change the way we've done this liquid chromatography. And so what we've done to assess this is we've, we've taken, um, um, so the study we're in is we're doing mouse tissue xenografts, so patient-derived mouse xenograft models where we've taken um, eight different samples and two mixed controls of all the samples uh, TMT labeled them into um, individual samples, mixed them together, um, high pH reverse phase fractionation um, on a you know, 1980s waters uh, um, binary HPLC pump, collected all 60 fractions and just loaded them. And what we did is we compared this in a really systematic study to concatenating these and doing four hour gradients on the EZ1000, um, all run on the Lumos. Um, and we've done both analysis with PD and with, with, with peaks as well. And so, you know, as we know, we're doing high pH fractionation here, we're doing low pH to go into the system. And what we found is that we're 
developing or identifying a huge number of proteins in far less time than we are with the traditional proteomics. So we basically did seven different studies where either we concatenated, where we started with half a milligram, or we concatenated started with an entire milligram, and you can see there's not much change there, probably because we're way over capacity anyways um, on the easy. And these experiments, you know, we're identifying 12,000 proteins, but we're, you know, 67 hours of mass spec time. When we go to the, the EVOSEP and the 30 sample per day, we drop that to 48, and, and we're seeing 12,000 IDs. Um, and then when we drop down to the, the 22 minute gradients, we're down to basically 24 hours of, of experiment time to identify 10,000 proteins in DDA across all 10 samples. Um, and we've even tried to concatenate those and run those on the EVOSEP, and we're still getting you know 8,000 quantifiable proteins um, in 12 hours. And so, you know, Going back to the core, this was all reduced mass spec time, reduced cost for the user, still get good quantitative data. Um, and all this, is, of course, is representing um, the data across 10 samples. But we also wanted to look at you know, something that Ole touched on at the beginning, is the reproducibility of, of the EVOSAP. And, and so what we live, these three biological replicates um, in the fractionation. So we just labeled them D1, D2, D3. And what you can see is when we look at at least protein identifications with at least two or three unique peptides, we are virtually seeing almost 100% overlap um, in the identified um, proteins identified. And similarly, if you look at it differently, at either the number of MSMS uh, spectra or the number of PSMs, they are quite tightly reproducible across um, fraction numbers. So, Regardless of biological replicate, you know, it's obviously the same sample, but a different, a different biological replicate, but being run in the same fractionation system, the same EVOSEP system, we're getting quite reproducible results. And, and so, you know, what does this compare to the concatenated, easy 1200 workflow? Um, we're seeing, you know, with, with um, Sorry, with the shorter run, there's a few overlap, but for the main part, we're seeing um, quite the same overlap with the same number of systems, just a lot less mass spec time required. Um, and when you start to look at what these proteins are, we see absolutely zero, no difference between um, just looking at go-ontology and the proteins identified, either biological, cellular, or molecular function. They're essentially the same proteins as we would um, expect, and, that, and that's summarized here. Um, and then when looking at the actual um, peptides that we're looking at in terms of that are coming off, what we did is we looked at the, the average uh, hydrophobicity um, of the peptides that were coming off and we see um, that there's no real difference between either the, the 22 minute EVOSAP or the, or the easy peptide. So, um, you know, it's, it's reproducible, it's giving us great data. Um, fractionation in the first dimension is obviously partially key in the data dependent, uh, you know, um, time without going into the DIA space, but the, the fractionation, you can see that we are getting also good reproducible uh, results with quite good separation um, running the different fractions. You know, we have quite, you know, a little bit of overlap between adjacent fractions, but quite little overlap between secondary fractions, and that those are significant um, differences. So, you know, getting the first stage clear before going on to loading on the EVOSAP is obviously um, important. So, so I wanted to, to talk a bit about how we can use the EVOSAP and, and as well as, as an assay that we developed in partnership with, with Thermal Fisher Scientific um, to talk about how these sort of quick short gradients can be used in research applications and clinical applications. So what we did as a using the same methodology as we were, as I was talking about earlier, is that we took uh, a number of xenograft, patient-derived, non-small cell, lung tensinoma xenograft models, 120 um, of them. Sorry about that. And we, we, took eight per TNT plus with two spiked in controls, like the CP TAC guidelines suggest. We reduced alkylated and digested those. And then we TNT labeled um, 
of those and put those into, into various groups and used the mixed samples as the normalizing samples uh, between TMT groups. And so each TMT group was then subjected to 2D fractionation using um, offline high pH reverse phase chromatography on a C18 column, and then run using EvoSec and 22 minute gradients um, combined with the Orbitrap Lumos. And so of the 120 tumors we quantified to a depth of greater than, than 12,000 protein identifications. And so at the time that we did this study, we, the study, the SureQuant kits, which I'll talk about, but basically um, they're complete pathway analysis kits. And so what we wanted to do is take a specific pathway and interrogate um, how that pathway is changing um, in these samples. And so at the time of selection, we didn't have the genetic information of these xenografts, so we looked at the at the total proteomic information and looked for uh, total AKT1 and AKT2 levels across all of the patient-derived tumors that were that were um, subjected to proteomic analysis. And you can see shown in this graph is the level of AKT1 in the gray and AKT2 in, in the yellow. And the uh, red arrows indicate the samples that were selected for proteomic analysis. And so what we attempted to do is to take uh, samples that had either high AKT2, high AKT1, uh, low AKT2, or AKT1 in one a normalized sample. And so when you have this and you want to look at, at complex signaling pathways and phosphorus signaling pathways, you really need to reduce the sample complexity. And so when you're looking at, at you know, if you're looking at proteins that are high abundance, and, and this group knows this, but if you're looking at uh, proteins that are very high abundance, you can just simply take your cells or your tissue, digest it, and, and go. Um, things in the medium abundant range, you may need a, a depletion um, of some proteins like IgGs or, or, or albumin, if that's around, um, followed by digestion or and, and or a fractionation. But to get to some of those really low um, level proteins, and, and these are the ones, of course, in the signaling pathways that are being uh, altered, is uh, an enrichment step is necessary. And so we worked with Thermo to test this SureQuant kit, which they have since released. Um, and basically what this does is you take your cells or your tissue or whatever your study material is, and you can multiplex together um, enrichment steps so that you are multiplex IPing all the proteins in a specific pathway. So in our case, the AKT pathway. And this can be done for total protein as well as phosphor protein. And so the kit comes with a sample prep, um, internal standard, system suitability mixes, um, as well as, as methodology. And, and we ran this both with a traditional um, easy nano LC as well as, as the EvoSEP. Um, shorter gradients. And so the the sample procedure is quite simple. You take your tumor, you lyse your cells, um, you incubate with your your antibody mixture. Uh, the antibody mixture is then incubated with biotinylated magnetic beads. Digestion occurs on the beads. And then uh, it's a one-step reduction alkylation um, and then followed by C18 purification. And so you prepare your samples and you sort of set those aside and then you go over to the mass spec. And so the purpose of when you're doing the mass spec is you first do a system suitability check. And so this is a provided standard and this is um, basically to ensure that your mass spec is um, operating at on optimal performance. Um, and then what you can do, and, and we did this, this diagram is obviously shown using using a longer gradient, um, but what we've shown you can do is then you can then take your uh, light peptide and generate a calibration curve. And we did this on the EvoSep using the 44-minute gradient, and you can see that we're able to detect and get a linear gradient of, this is a representative example, but for all the peptides in the pathway, 
This is AKT2. We're able to tell, go from 0.03 femtomoles up to 200 femtomoles. Um, and then that provides a, a representative example of, of what the complete mixture looks like and analysis by skyline. And so when we do this and look at, as a representative example here, false for AKT1 in, in these five tissues that I, that I told you about, or five models, we get beautiful, nice chromatography, and we can see that we are seeing both the light endogenous peptides as well as the spiked and heavy peptides. So this is one example of peptide one and, and peptide two shown here. And these are quantifiable, um, quantifying on the, on the fragments, um, like a traditional PRM study. Um, and you can see that we are able to clearly detect differences um, across the sample. So the top graph here is the, the quantification of the late peptides um, peptide one is then heavy and same for peptide two um, and the heavy. And if you take this and and put together the light the, the two light peptides, you can see that we're able to to actually accurately quantify um, changes at the femtomol level, um, absolute quantification of phosphor AKT1 in these tumor um, xenograft models. And so when we expand this out to the complete panel of signaling pathways, again, there are, and, and as to be expected, there are proteins that we really just do not see very much compared to the, to the positive control. And then there are proteins like phosphor AKT1 and AKT2 and F3 and GSK3B, where we do see changes um, in the signaling pathways. Um, and so this is really interesting because obviously different tumors may be operating um, or may be signaling through different ways. And so these sort of kits combined with the EVOCEP uh, technology has allowed us to, to quickly go through a number of these. And, and then the goal is to go through all 120 um, across multiple different um, signaling pathways. And so can we revert this back to total and, and a lot of you know, what's the true advantage to going to, to this depth for phospho and signaling pathways is that, you know, when we look back at sample D, well, sample D was actually the highest, um, I can no longer move my mouse, so there it is, the highest uh, AKT2. But when we look at, uh, in terms of the amount of phospho AKT2, it's actually the lowest of the ones tested. And we see the similar, uh, trend, although not as, as dramatic for for AKT um, one with the sample C, which was supposedly the highest, but it's clearly um, not the highest in terms of its signaling. So, you know, total protein level does not necessarily correlate to total signaling activity at the time of of sample prep. Um, and so, you know, that's just a little brief insight as to what we're up to and, and we're up to the Sick Kids facility. And, and I'd like to thank everyone involved in that project at Sick Kids, Dr. Michael Moran and, and Dr. Leanne Wadanga Group and Dr. Jeffrey Tong who helped with the, the generation of this project as well as, as all the samples. Um, our collaborators at UHM, Dr. Ming Sai and Dr. Nguyen Fan who generated this mouse xenograph model. Um, all of the folks at EVOCEP for having me here, but also working with us to get this set up and, and helping us in, in all the work that went into our publication um, to test out really the EVOCEP and, and how it's doing and, and in-depth proteomic studies. And, and my collaborators at Thermo have helped um, in terms of, of uh, keeping, helping us with the short point development, giving us early access to test that on our samples. Um, and our service engineers, can't forget them uh, for keeping our machines running. So, and with that, I'd like to ask if there's any questions. Thank you. I think it's a wrap.